the data. This computation is done incrementally only for the new updates, and that is continuously done. And so to you, it looks like you're operating on full large data sets that have already been created and materializing them. But in, in reality, these are just the containers. And we are operating on streams that have not even arrived yet. And we are only incrementally doing the processing as a data set. To understand that, let's you know, go to maybe this picture and see what might be happening. Focus on the purple side of it, what we call as a right part of this computation extreme left, we have your external data sources in here. So these might be your databases, software products, your snowflake warehouses, and things of that nature. You first mirror some of them in red. I showed you how to mirror by adding the different data in the data. So once you've made a copy of those, or rather a continuous in a streaming copy of those data sets in red, you can then build pipelines on top of that and derive more data from that. Uh, and you can recursively derive more on top of these derived data sets. So the whole system behaves, if that's not how it works, obviously what it behaves like an event-driven system. What that means is the moment data shows up in your external data sources, it propagates the whole graph to the second one. So if let's say you are you know, processing this streaming data, if the events are arriving in your graph plot process or whatever, as events arrive, of course, you know, they move forward. But let's say you are operating on batch data, let's say you are getting something from S3, why not so much? And S3 is getting data only once a day or something of that sort. When the data does arrive, it starts moving forward in the graph. Maybe it takes a few seconds, few minutes, few hours, depending on how much data there is to be processed. And when it is done, it goes back to sleep and then wakes up the next time new data has been written in that particular stream. So the whole system behaves like an event driven system. There is no distinction between batch and stream. You don't say this is batch and this is stream. You simply say, here's my data, mirror it, and now do interesting stuff with it. Under the hood, it is streaming all the time. It is built on what is called a graph architecture. Uh, and batch is just a special case of streaming, uh, you know, in our way of thinking about it. And so with this you know, uh, context, if you go back here, order itself could have been coming from batch data. It could have been coming from S3 or Snowflake or Postgres or whatever you know, Kafka canvases or recursively derived via pipelines. And same for product. And yet this code will be accurate. This code does not depend on where this data is coming from, right? whether it's batched or stream. This is very important. But further, if you think about it, imagine let's say you are a bank of some, some sort, and you have every time a user you know, swipes the credit card, you have a transaction logged to actual Kafka. You want to enrich those events. Let's say you want to add the zip code of, let's say, the store where the transaction happened. So the mapping of store ID to zip code, you have to let's say in your Postgres database. Uh, you're now able to do real-time joins, streaming joins, between data that's flowing through Kafka and data that lives in your Postgres. And this is something Kafka would not let you do, and this is something Postgres would not let you do. So if you elevated all your data in the same plane of construction, how can it? Can we, uh, we store data in the appropriate way that we can do updates on top of this? You could have API all of this in Snowflake or some demos or S3, and then did a join there, and then brought it back, but that won't be real time. Too. So here you're able to do all of these operations in real time, and you're able to interoperate on data across data systems as well. Uh, Wes, you were talking about versioning. These pipelines are actually version. Each version itself is immutable. Once created, a version can never be modified. So it eliminates those kinds of problems where some uh, you know, feature was written, some model was trained, then someone came back and modified the feature definition, and now you know, you're doing it by streaming something that's not moving because data is not happening. Versions are immutable. You can have a lot of versions coexisting at any point of time, and uh, they all coexist, they'll all be computed, uh, and you can then throw away one of them when you're testing that. that only that data goes away that is contained in the test and there. That's a very nice, you know, version definition. Uh, one problem that I think uh, in practice is very uh, you know, painful is backfilling these production sources. People have to write these one-off scripts which you know, read some data, do some processing, and write it in add on time as well as you know, when you want to know quickly, you know, what's load and things like that. In Fedor, there is no backfilling operation. As pipelines are declared, that just leads to backfill itself. As the system
some disturbance of this pipeline has been seen for the first time. To start from the beginning of the time and backwards the whole thing. So a really nice way of writing uh, pipelines. Uh, in addition to you know this uh, nice, we also ship a dashboard where you can see all the data sets that exist. You can do a drawn search and filtering on that. You can see how many rows are arriving per second. If you wrote data expectation, you can see how many are those that the regular system comes out. If you wrote pipelines, you can see their code and the customers as well. We automatically infer the lineage, like how the data was derived. And so in this case, you know, as data was derived from clicks via a pipeline called our clicks, and you can infer the code of that as well. Uh, so there's a lot of you know uh, interesting and cool stuff here. Uh, obviously, there's more uh, more to show, but I, I think this is sufficient for you all to understand the personality of what we're trying to build here. Yeah. Uh, Matt, do you secure data in transit and in storage if you have a local copy? Uh, yeah, yeah. So all our data is uh, encrypted, uh, both uh, at rest and in transit. You know, due to TLS uh, and it is also only living inside in the customer cloud. Uh, local data is good for testing and you know, you know those kinds of things, but really uh, for you know real workloads, it's all running inside cloud. And then we do a bunch of things where you know those cloud hosts are not accessible from the public internet and things like that. So there's a lot of things to see here. So I know you've mentioned use cases that are structured data so far. Do you handle for unstructured, semi-structured? Yes, I mean, if you think about what we are offering, and I mean, I haven't gone through the full thing, but if you think about it, it's basically a better way of doing uh, you know, streaming data transformations, computations along with storage and stuff, and things like that, and you know, quality checks and monitoring and so on. Uh, so, yes, we could do this through unstructured data as well. Uh, and this is what I might tell you that this concept of a feature store is probably you know, our side of selling alternative. Feature stores are probably more relevant for structured data platforms. For unstructured data, your data itself is you know what you train your model from. But if you wanted to do some interesting computation, you could do that too. As an example, I was chatting with uh, a large you know media uh, company a few uh, few days ago. Uh, what they were potentially considering to subscribe, and one of the use cases they had was you know you know these news journalists who are living life very fast, but then you know. They want to do some kind of division processing on that life very fast before it is shown to the end user. So they are just going to be a second or so of data that they can have. But then they want to you know, run some interesting algorithms on that. And it's basically a case of you know extremely unstructured video frame data. But then you want to apply some interesting real time machine learning processing on it uh, with low you know, latency, then our cloud is a good, uh, you know, good option for that use case. Any other questions? Okay. Is there any benchmarks on your latency uh, metrics and everything? Like, uh, say, consider if I if I have to hold your uh, feature store uh, in live query, so um, how fast it is? Yeah. So, um, so there are two parts, of, or uh, uh, at least two parts of the you know, benchmarking. One is when the data is arriving, how much lag is there? for data to continue propagating forward on the right path. There we offer a few seconds of lag. So if an event happens, and then a few seconds instead of traffic as well. Then on the read side, when you're trying to read a feature, uh, we try to uh, offer single digit milliseconds you can see here. But uh, the challenge obviously is, you know, it's like a database. If you write a select star query, then there's no amount of you know, optimization that can put a limit on it. So you write your feature, you decide your logic. You could write something crazy. You could write an infinite loop inside a feature that is not there. But if you're doing reasonable things in a single trade, you second, then you continue to things. So how do I query? It There's is a rest end point that is exposed, uh, okay. which you can hit. I mean, the whole thing about feature, I've not even gone into that. I've yeah. only shown you the right side processing. Mm -hmm. The read side processing, I've not even covered that. But there is a rest end point. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? So and uh, so to that endpoint, you actually apply SQL queries. So how do I actually query from my uh, aggregated data? Right. So so there is a separate layer uh, uh, of what is called as a feature set, which is a separate layer of processing on top of your aggregated data, and this is written in Python. 
And when you filter the rest endpoint, you are effectively saying give me let's say these three features. So those three features may then trigger some computation on top of the local gallery basically. Right. Yeah. And you, you mentioned, I mean, you know, what little experience I have working with like uh, Databricks or Snowflake. The the pipeline you can make with those products, this is the main differentiating it here is actually latency improvement. It's it's gonna be faster real time pipeline for streaming versus pipelines that are lagging. Also so simpler, right? Simpler. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> simpler so too. You're writing real Python kind of. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Also no operations whatsoever. Yeah. Uh, you know we handle all of that. You know, much stronger support for quality. Uh, most of these systems don't support. And you can build your own processing steps that are monitoring and doing something with those things where some of you might be using aggregate expectation where you need to build a quality checks. But those are additional things. You know, they're not part of the pipeline system itself. So this is a bunch of things like that. So uh, yes, the big difference is streaming. So then if you stack all of those you know, one by one, it ends up being a complete layer system. The big difference is streaming, but like let's say I have a model in production and I'm monitoring for drip, but I don't need to monitor in real time, but I do need some pipeline set up to do, do some things that was offline. Right, so, this, so this can handle that as right, well, right? right? We so just so we set up like some batch pipelines, and then you're like, okay, now I need to back to nothing, how do you do it? And then you have one batch pipeline in the beginning, but then you know over time you have three more, and they depend on each other in the data stream. And then now you have you know, these weird scheduling dependence. Like the system gets really complex very soon. Mm -hmm. uh, and with this, all of that can just be. Okay. Uh, is this helpful in like retraining use cases where you have like a database that you still in? It, it does, it does. So uh, I think more generally, one of the bigger challenges that users don't originally conceive to solve mm -hmm. is when you train a model, whether you're doing retraining on it or not, when you train a model, you want to know the feature values as of the time of training data example. So let's say you know, you're doing fraud detection uh, and you, know, you have some information about a user who's just signed up and you have to decide if it is fraudulent or not, right? And then you know, a month later, you're now training a model and this example is a, one of the training examples in the training data set. You need to know what are the feature values as of the time the model was invoked. And it basically had almost no information. As opposed to the information that the model may have had. Then maybe now the user is in a bunch of transactions. At that point of time, they are not, as an example, right? And so you almost have to do some sort of a time travel to go back and understand what feature values might have been as of the time of prediction for each example of the training data. Now if you're trying to do this object, you know, object detection, you know, face detection, whatever, some visual thing, you know, some you know, chat GPT, you know, language ne next token prediction, they don't change over time. So your training data sets are basically static. The moment you go in a more dynamic, you know, structured world, the latent training data itself becomes static. And then you add retraining complexity on top of that. So what you know products like this do, and you know, also does that very well is if you want to read feature values, it will obviously help you with that. But if you say, I want feature values for this example as of, you know, last Monday, 11 a.m., 15 seconds, the second example as of, you know, last Tuesday as of this time, and this, you know, and you have like a million examples like this, each of them in different time stamps, it is able to do, do, do the time travel. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, so, uh, so now I'm gonna, you know, switch gears a little bit. I'm now going to go very deep into our, you know, infrastructure and architecture as well. So we're now going to, you know, step away from the machine learning world for a few minutes and look at what actually enables us to create this experience. You know, the TLDR is we have written our own streaming system and our storage system from scratch using Rust. I will not, you know, talk about Rust itself, but the architectural ideas that are coming to this. So first of all, as I mentioned, you know, we unify batch and stream processing under a single stream processing framework. Under the hood, what we've written is something like Spark. Uh, Spark streaming, in fact, a flip if you use those. But you can combine Spark and streaming in a you know, more elegant, more natural way. Uh, and this ends up removing a whole ton of complexity. When you have a separate batch mode and a separate streaming mode, they have all sorts of crazy interaction modes to themselves. 
you will see how streaming features because as you now you just wrote it you want to backfill older data which is bad so that that same feature but going forward you want it to be streaming you know it's, it's a mess right and there are lots of interaction modes like that where you have something like this something like this you're now trying to do something that comes together and it's not clear what the right programming model for this thing is by unifying them like truly at a very deep level all of that works all of those quantum cases are gone and the exact same code works across in batch and stream I was talking to a company uh, a few weeks ago, and they are uh, in the process of transitioning to be more human. And one of their concerns was, we want to write something that works in the batch world right now, but when you do go real time later, six months later, we don't want to come back and basically rebuild everything we did at all. And there, you know, it should maybe take a one line change somewhere, and the whole thing becomes real time in the sense of the box. Uh, we have what, what what we call a Z drive separation. Uh, I didn't cover that during the you know when I was doing the product overview. Uh, but the idea is you do not think of features as stored data files, which is actually pretty you know major paradigm shift. We think of features as functions, uh, and then you want to for every feature there is a function back in it, and you want to read a feature value, you identify the function behind the feature and run that. Now that function will be doing a data lookup. And in that case, you could fall back to store data as your feature value. But now that function can do more interesting processing. Also. So an example I like to give is, let's say you have to build a feature which is, let's say, how long has this user been a part of your platform? You cannot pre-compute that quantity, changing every second. If you want to do it real time, right? it's changing every second. This is a case where you have to pre-compute some quantity. In this case, you know, the, the timestamp at which they signed up for your platform. So then compute the age on the platform by subtracting it from the current time. It's a very you know, trivial example, but there are many cases where you have to do what we call as read side computation, some computation on top of pre-computed age, and that becomes your feature value. So you have a natural read write separation. Uh, we decided early on that we wanted you know, to have people like free from Python. We believe that we should meet our users where they are. Uh, and if that requires us to take on some hard challenges, we would rather do that, as opposed to forcing a you know, challenge down uh, to our users. I think a lot of other products in the ML space, even right now, effectively end up you know, creating some sort of a domain-specific language library, like a very rigid thing, where we cannot you know, import arbitrary Python things and do arbitrary things with them. It basically becomes its own you know, mini, you know, mini grammar, mini language, and things that you can do with that. We decided early on that we wanted to enable the full power of Python. And that actually creates a lot of you know, scaling and performance challenges for us on the backend side. Uh, but we would rather handle those as a storage and streaming there once and for all, as opposed to having every you know, customer, every user start with this. We have a lot of concerns about data quality. Uh, usually, a lot of other ML systems uh, are not, you know, data quality and feature quality is an afterthought usually. Uh, you do everything else, and then like, oh, this is what do we do, and then you go in something, something, most of the time, you know. So we knew that we wanted to build a platform where these primitives are just a core part of how everything works together. And you cannot do things that are not compliant from data quality point of view at all. Like, it's just an opinionated framework from that point of view. We built our own stream processing system uh, instead of using, you know, Flink or Spark. That, just, just at the outset, sounds like a bad idea, but we still thought that it was the right decision for us because there were a bunch of design goals that we had which Spark and Flink, none of them satisfied for us. We wanted to have low memory consumption. Uh, you know, if, uh, how many people did Spark for you? No, okay. Uh, ever experienced out of memory problems? Yeah, yeah. yeah okay, great. Uh, I've yet to meet someone who did Spark and not experience that. And so we wanted just to you know, get rid of that altogether. We wanted to have no single point of failure because the whole cluster can be nine clusters in a hundred machines and some machine goes down and you know everything else continues working. Uh, and generally you know it's much easier to run and deploy, etc. Which brings me now I'm now gonna go a level deeper into the you know the streaming system and I'll you know try to you know breeze through this. Um, we have built up a streaming system using Rust in a way that the unit of scheduling is a shard of a Python. And so, uh, 
So, so there is a notion of a data parallelism where multiple you know, shards of data can continue being processed in parallel without blocking on each other. Um, and then there are multiple of these that are using the same CPU probably or the same clock data storage in some space. And so it ends up being extremely efficient on CPU. Uh, we are checkpointing the system all the time. Uh, and so any machine can go down and we know how to recreate it and restart it without losing any data whatsoever. This is happening continuously. And unlike Flink, this is also a distributed checkpointing system. So that means there is every component is doing its own checkpoint. And it's not a global single large checkpoint for which we need to stop the world so it's free. The benefit of this is if let's say you wrote a new feature or a new data set, we don't have to pause the whole system that is running from you know moving forward, add your changes to it and restart it. You can incrementally do each node at a time in a way that you know, the whole cluster still continues to make progress over uh, the same duration. Uh, we wanted to uh, have no synchronous communication between moving pieces. Uh, this means that uh, if one component is down, anyone else that was trying to communicate with it will also go down. In our design, that's not the case. You know, there is no communication that's synchronous. Some PCs can go down, and all other PCs, even those that are supposed to talk to this, you know, piece can continue making progress. And we you know, heavily rely on Kafka and Google to do that. We have almost no in-memory state for these you know, systems. We very aggressively store all the state on disk. Uh, and as a result of that, no matter what happens, we just simply cannot go out of memory almost by direct um, And you know, it helps that we are using Rust, which is not garbage connected. So we very tight you know, controls are being put in it as well. Uh, the whole system is exactly once processing. For those of you who have you know, dabbled with you know, data pipelines, this would probably uh, make sense. Uh, it would fail a little of error, but we'd never be over counting or under counting. Everything will be done exactly once on the screen. Um, there is no central scheduler for our system. Uh, in a lot of these systems, in a Spark, for instance, has a scheduler, Flink has a scheduler, and a lot of these you know, complex data systems have schedulers which decide what each node in the cluster should do. We don't have a scheduler of any kind. Each node is independent of the other node what it's supposed to do. And as a result of that, once again, there's no single point of failure. The scheduler goes down, the cluster is not making any progress. It's not the case for us. Uh, and then, uh, this is a very nuanced point. I mentioned in our training data set, we need to go time travel and understand how to create values of features that were older. Uh, we have built up our streaming system in a way that it itself has a notion of time frame. And we could tell the streaming system that show me what the state of this data would have been as of this you know, past previous point. And it would know what to do that. And this allows it to handle, you know, out of order data, late arriving data, all of those things are very fast. As an example, if you are using Facebook, and you know, Facebook needs to, you know, uh, export your impression log from a mobile device to the server, and then do some machine learning on that. But let's say before those logs could be exported to the server, your phone rang. Server of charge, or you know, it's in a corner of the house. You don't know where it is. You're looking for it. It's left. You wake up, let's say, a day later, or maybe a week later, depending on how often you use your phone, and then you turn it on. And only then the, those logs are going to the server. So this data is arriving on the server maybe a day, maybe day late, maybe a week late, you know, far after it was expected to arrive. So it is out of order data. And you still want all of those pipelines to work out in a way that you thought they would, even though the data is in out of order. So by making it time aware, we can handle all of that. Finally, for a storage engine, uh, we use a RocksDB. Uh, any, any of you have heard about RocksDB? Okay, great. So RocksDB is a key value store uh, written by Facebook. Uh, that's what we're using under the hood uh, to power all of this. Um, when we have a RocksDB, you know, things are being written to it, uh, but a job may have to be restarted, maybe there's an error of some kind. So to do exactly once processing, we write all the data that we need to write to RocksDB in a Kafka as well. And then you know, reprocess it from there. That allows us to you know, do exactly what's processing for change logs as well. Uh, there's an Amazon service called EFS, Elastic File System. We use that to take all our backups. Um, and so we can do very you know, incremental backup every few minutes. And so if there is a large cluster, let's say Amazon itself goes down, we can go back and recreate you know, the whole cluster um, as needed. And we are building our own database called Gravel as well, which in the Go version that we wrote, uh, you know, became 
the fastest database in the whole world. They are trying to put it to Rust and maybe open source it or some other thing. And that's one. So we went through a long journey. We started with you know what feature problems exist in the machine learning world, like back here. And then we talked about how we have created a I guess a sense of abstraction and custom that you know just has most of the features by design. And we look at you know how do we actually build the system in a way that comes at the end. Can I stop there? Any questions in any of this? Cool, I guess we can stop there. Thanks for everyone. We have some swag over here as well if you guys wanna grab some t-shirts or socks or some stickers and stuff. And uh, thank you so much for giving me the chance to come here. I got one. So, so, do you have any feature uh, like helper functions like standard out of the box uh, kind of a no. helper function which can automatically calculate if I have a new database instead of me having to write all data? No. So, we are not trying to uh, replace what the data scientist does. Uh, we are trying to handle the infrastructure work that they need to do. Uh, and so, you know, there's probably a Python package out there which might do that for you. You are welcome to import that and use that. But kind of it's a good one. Any idea of what is the maximum data which you are handling? Right it's, now? No, no, no. it's all horizontally scalable. Uh, okay. So you can just keep throwing more nodes and more machines and it'll just handle No, so, uh, I mean, you are existing. Uh, Lows, I think you know, know how far have you gone? Tens of terabytes is, uh, you know, I guess very easy to do. Uh, and, and then even at that scale, your latency is still uh, great. What about interacting with your REST API for you know the end user, so to speak? What is that? What does that look like? You know, what what sort of interactions are you expecting your end user? To, uh, yes, I think so. First of all, the end user will be writing this Python code to describe the features and data in the pipeline and all of that. Once they have written that, then send them to the server. Server does a bunch of you know, validations and verifies that things looking good. If it is, then server is on the hook for computing those quantities and you know, keeping those features ready. But all of that's been done. There's a REST endpoint that can be hit. To read those computed feature values. This is a Python wrapper on that, but there is a REST endpoint under the under the hood as well. That you can say, I'm interested in these your seven features. There is input information that you need, there's the user ID, you know, whatever IDs are, you know, kind of other pieces of information. And you actually pass the values of those user IDs and other you know, properties for each of the features. And you get all of that back uh, you know, in the REST response. And if you wanted to train a model, and you know you are now looking for let's say feature values for let's say 100 million data examples. Uh, there is a parallel API which is you know historical values of these features, uh, and there you know uh, we can write the output to S3, and you can just start reading from there. And you know it maybe takes in you know, an hour, maybe three hours for us to you know write all of it to compute and write all of it to S3. But while this is happening, you can already start you know creating your model, the data itself. Did that answer question? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Hey, um, so I'm from academia, so my questions might be a little off. I was wondering why you would need one feature version for one data point and a different version for a different data point. Like, what's the what's the purpose of that in production? Yeah. Okay. And so I have another. You can go. I know. Okay. Yeah. And also, so you're you're talking about the way you're treating features as as functions. So it occurs to me that it's kind of similar to TensorFlow pre-processing that you're saying. So what's, what's the uh, idea? Yeah, okay, so I think the first question is, wh what is the real world use case for having different time points for different features? Different data points, yeah. Okay, so um, let's say, you know, we, are, we all work at Netflix, and you're trying to build a movie recommendation. Uh, and you know, uh, we have to decide if there's a particular movie that we should be recommending as a to us. And we 
uh, you know, whatever processing happens, we decide to recommend it to him. But he, let's say, did not click on it. Or let's say he clicked on it. Uh, and now we have some data, we can list, you know, we want to train some model. Uh, and, you know, we have collected a month's worth of such data. So millions of users like this, and, you know, hundreds of millions of sessions over a month. Each of them have their own movies and own users, and, you know, we had to, we, had, we made some predictions. And we recorded what we showed to the user, and we also recorded what the user did with us, right? And now this is the data that was used to train us on. Now imagine that you know we did we were considering whether to show something to this or not. We ended up showing it to him. He clicked on it. And we have a feature which is has the user seen this movie or not? Um, clearly it is going to be yes for this specific example, even though when our model was supposed to make that prediction, in that moment it could not have known whether Wes would end up watching that movie. Does that make sense? And so when you build features for that specific example, you need to make sure that those features are not leaking information from the time that is in the feature when Wes was you know, viewing that movie, so to speak. You're not supposed to leak information from the future into the past. Right? But you're also versioning the data, right? See, th these are different things. So versioning of data means that you might have three different, you know, uh, you know, pipeline definitions, maybe starting with some definition. You then decided, you know what, maybe should add log normalization somewhere, or maybe I should, you know, do some other kind of processing. So three different you know, versions of definitions. But imagine you only have one version per second. For that single version of a feature, you do want to compute features at different time points for different, you know, rows in a training data essentially. And for a given row, you want the feature values to only have access to information as of that time, not from the future. Right? So versioning of pipelines and data and features is an independent thing. And having features computed as of a particular time span, different potential for each training <coughs> example, is a different thing. And we have already have both of them. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Sir? Yeah, I'm on, um, so I want to do is apply this to something from the beginning, but I was going to ask, so what I understand so far is this is a, um, I guess, managed platform for both Kafka and AWS, I mean, used on Kafka and AWS for data scientists, right, to sort of abstract the infrastructure work it's supposed to be. So if I was coming from a sort of training background and um, I'm used to scaling operations of Kafka in Mexico, probably, um, what would the trade-offs be for choosing um, the disk-based infrastructure over the memory-based one? Because I know you said you made the trade-offs there, but what would I be losing? I'd have to account for yeah, that. Right. So first of all, you know, uh, we use any cloud as a whole. It's not just Amazon. You know, cloud could be like Google or Azure or you know, if you know how to do that. Kafka is one of the many systems that a production system like this for any company that you can imagine would use. But Kafka only stores data and you know transfers data. You need to do some real-time processing on top of that, right? You know, because you have people writing a slew of processing systems. And you have storage streaming and clearing systems on top of those. Once these streaming systems have computed something using the data that's flowing in Kafka, that computed data needs to be stored so that we can do serving on it. Typically people use a key value store, you know, Red Hat, Google Dynamo, you know, some of those systems store it. Then all of this I described works for streaming, but then you know more often than not you're doing batch processing. And so then you cannot operate on Kafka anymore, and so then you need to you know integrate data and so on. So my point is it's not like we are replacing Kafka here. So like you know, a million different pieces that all need to come together in the right, you know, perfect way. Otherwise you you'd not be able to do certain things. And so you, I I I would almost describe this as a higher level product that does use Kafka and a bunch of those things as underlying primitives, but just not computing on them or iterating on them. So that's, you know, one thing I'd say. Then what this is your disk versus memory. And again, the end of the day, it's a performance, you know, uh, cost trade-off, usually. If you store, if you do everything in memory, you know, your performance will be higher. But it gets very costly, very slow. I think in modern cloud systems, RAM is a costless component here. Um, and I think, even if you could afford to spend all that money 
In a lot of cases, the performance gain you get is not in the place where that actually happens. Uh, you know, in a complex system, some pieces are bottom up for the other guy not. And if you try to even throw more RAM at those pieces, you, yes, you could maybe improve it faster, but does it make a difference? It's not really. And so, I think for me, it's not, you know, discourses around, but rather where do you put disk and where do you put RAM? Which then, once again, requires a lot of effort. So I would say that an ideal solution has some combination of both. Building a magic is a lot of work, it's really hard. And that's something, you know, that, you know, a platform that we serve. In other words, you can trade off some speed as long as the latency doesn't suffer. That's right. That's right. Thank you. And I think there are also more situations where there is literally no bound on how much noise you want to make. So, so there's a sudden you know surge in arriving data, and all of a sudden you are processing you know five x more data in a given second than you typically would process. There's a, there's only so much you know memory in whatever server you're using. So it will basically crash at that point. So by relying on disk more heavily, you can make your system a little bit more easy. Um, what is your pricing structure, and then do you have any like non-commercial testing options for like a dev to play around with at home? Yeah, so let me ask, answer the second question first. Uh, you can literally open up a notebook uh, and install this library, and you know, uh, one code block or code block, just paste them in all those cells, and it will work. Uh, and so, uh, and you don't need an API token or anything of that sort. And the reason that will work is everything that I described, we have built it in Rust, but we've also built it the second time using Python. And we ship that Python version inside the library itself. And we make sure that they're always in sync with each other. Obviously, the Python version is not efficient and it can automate scale and this and that. But if you wanted to just play around with it, you could do so. The other benefit of doing that is. Even in production setting, you want to write unit tests for your, you know, uh, you know, your ML pipeline and so on. By having a whole thing running in, you know, Python in memory now is really good. Now for the pricing, uh, you know, some combination of usage based pricing and some combination of, you know, monthly fee for licensing and support and things like that. Yeah, we can explore offline if you're interested. Would you consider that your platform is feature complete at this point, or uh, do you have anything new and exciting in the works to come? Very new software. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, no, I don't think we are feature complete. Uh, we have a things to improve. Uh, we don't know how to read data from MongoDB yet, as an example. There's a lot of issues we to do. Uh, lots of small things like that, which Individually, one could shrug and say, yeah, you know, what's the big deal? I think all the big pieces are in place. The whole thing works. But now it's a question of integration. There are a lot of integrations like that, which we're adding in over the long as we're doing this. And then, in, in, in addition to that, in parallel to that, you know, performance and efficiency is something that we can keep improving further. We can always squeeze more out of the hardware we have. And, you know, it's still fun, you know, ways of doing so that work is always happening, scalability, performance, reliability, and efficiency. And then one, one more follow-up. So uh, you mentioned using EFS for data storage. I know you also mentioned, though, that you allow other clouds as well. So, I mean, is, is that a bottleneck on, or would no, you natively it, support all that? There's a, uh, so, you know, model, there are three big clouds, right? Amazon, Google, and Azure. They're not actually extremely similar to each other in most, you know, big data environments. And so for every underlying, you know, fundamental service like S3, you know, there's an almost identical service like that in Google and, you know, Azure as well. So when I say EFS, even though I'm using the word of an Amazon specific service, what I'm really describing is the, the characteristics of that service. And there's a service in Google World and Azure World that are the exact same characteristics. Cool. All right. Any last questions? Uh -huh. Sorry. Yeah. So, uh, it, like, uh, it's answered the hard. Uh, so, in your experience, Go versus Rust, uh, how do you judge that? If you are not building a database or something you know, that performance critical, I think you should probably be writing Go. Go is you can you can pick up Go in an evening and then be you know, fluent by you know the next evening, like really fluent. 
that's 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 all there is to know. It's like really really simple to write, really really simple. But it gives you phenomenal sounds. Mm-hmm. Like you know, go into Python of compiled languages and you know, really fast build times, really good testing support, really good you know uh, ecosystem around it, really really good. But if you want to squeeze out every last bit of performance out of the hardware, uh, then goes garbage collection, and then the memory, you know, uh, memory management starts going in the way. Then you would need to go to, you know, C or C plus plus or Rust one of these three languages, I think, or some other language of this family, not even Java, honestly, at that point. So unless you're in that world, you you don't sort of Rust is incredibly hard to write. Mm-hmm. Like, like, let me just put it in, you know, big double quotes. Mm-hmm. It takes anyone six. It took not not anyone. It took me six months to become proficient with Rust. It has never happened in my whole life that I'm struggling to write, figure out a language. Like not you know how to use that language to build something, but Rust is incredibly painful. So if you don't need to write Rust, don't write it. But if you have performance problems, you would not go to the pen. Definitely not C plus. <laughs> I don't like writing it. It's just uh, <laughs> for legacy reasons and cyber security, it, it comes up a lot. Yeah. All right. I guess that's all. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Please keep it up. Thank you. And please, more pizza if you'd like. And of course, you're welcome to socialize for another 15, 20 minutes. So Is thank you all. Parking validation. Uh, yes, uh, we sh- she should be back any minute for, let me check, but yeah, there is parking validation. So, are you head start of Austin or Kelsey? Are you head start of Austin or Kelsey? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How long did you all be pitching? How long have you been doing? I'm sorry, I'm not a good friend. How old is this? Close to two years now. Close to two years now. Close to two years now. No one's gonna grab these t-shirts then? Yeah, no. Let's say, uh, no, 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 what do you say? Are you have a CF? No, no, no. I came here for the first time last month. Yeah. Uh, this group of people. Yeah. So I don't want to come back here. Yeah. I didn't know you saw how much they can do. We're definitely up here in this room and somebody Every
and you were looking at drivers and the things that you yeah. um, had to so run off, industrial waste, and how that affects your health. Right now, we're using that in Europe. Our models are worked a little bit with the in Europe, so very technical. We're not going to have to have a lot of Love to think about all these things that you have to over, but that's totally on There's a lot of things that you bring it up. You may not be aware of those. So, as a that have Yeah, pollution, runoff, But there's a lot of things that we're doing I don't know. People have different. Like, if I went to Jews in tent, it would be kind of fun. But I know. Yeah, just find some reactor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah.